I would also like to give my thanks to, to Peter for taking the time, especially when he's on the road um, to join us for this session today. Um, I think it's, it will, uh, has, has set a good uh, kind of a groundwork um, for the stakeholder perspectives panel. So um, as uh, Leah said earlier, um, I'm Heather Staines. I'm a senior consultant at Delta Think, um, and I'm joined today uh, by five speakers. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves as part of the first question around, but I will let you know um, who they are. Um, we'll have Ray Pun, um, who is an academic and research librarian at the Alder Graduate School of Education. Kyle Jensen, who is a researcher and instructor at Arizona State University. Teresa Fusito, who is director of content operations for AIPP. Uh, Kyle K. Courtney, uh, who is copyright advisor at Harvard University. And Danielle Cooper, uh, Director, Libraries, Scholarly Communication and Museums for Ithaca SNR. So welcome uh, to all of our speakers. Uh, there are no slides for this session, so I'll ask um, Leah to go ahead and take that down. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful to see uh, everyone's uh, smiling faces today. Um, and I'm, I'm just checking with Kyle and Teresa, you guys are there. Um, I'm here. I'm, I'm not able to turn on my camera for some reason. It's not letting me. Let me work on that, Kyle and Teresa. I'm sorry about that. Give me just a second. Okay. Thank you. Great. So what we hope to do with this um, discussion is to kind of bring varying perspectives in. Um, Peter was, uh, was great uh, to uh, allude to like some of the, the technical perspectives, the library perspectives, um, those of us who are working in the information industry um, perspectives. So we wanna take this opportunity to just go a little bit deeper uh, in that conversation. There's Kyle. Um, and so uh, first up, I'm just gonna ask everyone to give a brief uh, introduction, uh, why uh, they felt that it was really important to be part of this panel uh, today, um, some of the uh, perspectives um, that uh, they represent, and then um, we'll do more of a deep dive. I'm just gonna go the order that folks are appearing uh, in front of me. So I'm gonna start with Kyle Courtney. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't ready to go first, no problem. I am, my name's Kyle Courtney, obviously, uh, I'm copyright advisor at uh, Harvard Library. Uh, I wear uh, multiple hats here, but today I'm putting on my copyright scholarly hat for the moment because certainly this massive revolution in artificial intelligence uh, has implications, I think, for the legal field. There were some, um, at least, allusions to that in the earlier talk. Um, and I think the cultural, social, and educational ramifications of these advanced technology has its footprint, though, in a lot of stuff in which technology does often challenge the notions of law and specifically copyright. Um, but I'm here today to talk a little bit more about how the possibility of what we've been through in the past with regards to Google Books um, and Happy Trust and a number of other issues could possibly move the scope forward for transformative fair use, which is kind of the newest and most interesting way in which you could train an AI set. Um, so I'll talk more about that and, and I will not limit it just to chat GPT, which is textual based. Um, you know, mid-journey, stable diffusion, DALI. We've actually seen lawsuits already emerge from the art side of the house, and certainly we collect that as well in the library system. So um, I will be talking a little bit about that. That's why I'm here, I think. <laughs> At least why you invited me, Heather. So thank you. Right. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts across all of that. Um, and next up again on my screen is Ray. Great. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you so much for attending today's session. My name is Ray Pan, pronouns are he and him, and I am a teacher educator as well as a librarian. So I, I teach teachers, uh, people who are trying to get their master's and credentials at my program in the state of California. And in addition, I'm also a faculty member as well. So working with other faculty members on thinking about how ChatGBT is impacting the learning of our teachers as well as, as, well as their students, the K-12 students. So it's sort of like um, there are different sort of uh, layers, almost um, a shell within a shell within a shell. But, but in general, I um, have been involved in a, a lot of these conversations with other fellow academic and school librarians about ChatGBT and generative AI tools and its impact on teaching and learning. And uh, that is why I'm, I'm here today. Thanks. Thank you. It's kind of like an inception, the way you describe it. 
uh, Danielle Cooper. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Cooper, and I am a director of libraries, scholarly communications, and museums at Ithaca SNR, which is a not for profit research organization that focuses on information and technology practices in higher ed. Ithaca SNR's research is public facing and as part of the work that we do, uh, we track the perspectives of higher education decision makers and other stakeholders, including uh, national studies of faculty, library directors, senior research officers, just to name a few. And at Ithaca SNR, we're developing a new research project for the fall in collaboration with a group of universities that are prioritizing constructive engagement with generative AI on their campuses. And the project will include systematically observing patterns in the technology's uptake, evaluating those use cases for their risks and rewards, and developing you know, university-wide guidance uh, for its use and preparing staff, students, researchers, instructors accordingly. So I, I'm here today to provide a bird's eye view on how generative AI is being approached in higher ed, including variations and similarities between different stakeholder perspectives. Um, and I'm happy to provide a link to the project from Ithaca, although flagged to the organizers at Charleston, um, it looks like I can only post to the other panelists in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll post the link in that chat and maybe they'll be able to, to share it with the wider group. It's thrilled to be here. Um, thanks so much for inviting me. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Kyle Jensen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kyle Jensen. Um, I'm the Director of Writing Programs at Arizona State University, which is one of the largest writing programs in the country. I'm also a professor of English who specializes in the histories and theories of writing. So I've been writing about uh, artificial intelligence and large language modeling for a little over seven years now. Uh, it's an area of interest for me. Uh, it's one of those fascinating components of life where I can talk with uh, academics about it and then have a conversation with someone at my dinner table who I had no idea was even interested in these kinds of, of issues and they'll start asking me really thoughtful questions about it. So I agreed to be on this particular panel because I think the more opportunity we have to flesh out and gain multiple perspectives on this really important topic, the more prepared we'll feel, feel for the future. Thank you. And uh, Teresa, if you see that. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Teresa Fusito, and I'm the Director of Content Operations at AAP Publishing. And, um, you know, the area um, that I'm responsible for is um, largely the support of the peer review process um, and the editorial offices, the support for our editors and our um, journal managers, as well as the publication and production process for um, articles and hosting on the platform. And you know why I'm I'm interested in in this particular topic, Chat GPT. You know, from a publisher's perspective, um, AP Publishing, along with our journal editors, are members of Cope, um, and we use those Cope guidelines to help support and guide all aspects of publication ethics. Um, and this is an evolving landscape, um, and Cope guidelines, um, in particular, to Chat GPT. Um, tell us that, um, that it's not authoritative. So that means that, you know, chat GPT um, cannot be listed um, as an author. So um, that and other similar AI based, you know, large models um, should not be listed. And if it's used um, in preparing um, research papers and uh, research work, it needs to be flagged up to the editors so that, you know, we're aware of this um, um, when a manuscript is submitted. Um, you know, we we also look at other AI tools um, that can help support the authors um, through their you know research and publication journey. But that's why you know I'm here today with a with a perspective from the publisher on ChatGPT. Thanks so much. So we're going to get um, into it. I think uh, Peter did a great job at um, uh, various levels uh, introducing us to uh, you know generative AI. Um, Kyle Jensen, you've been studying uh, this for quite some time. Maybe uh, could you just uh, maybe layer on a little bit more uh, perspective from your side um, and tell us how you got interested in the topic. I got interested in the topic because my former dissertation advisor asked me to do a favor, to him a favor. He was con he was uh, collecting, he was creating an co edited collection called Authorship Contested, and he needed an extra author uh, to fill out the collection and asked me what I thought about the possibility of being involved in the project. 
And at the time, I will admit that I didn't know very much about large language modeling. This is a little over seven years ago, um, but I started doing research in it. I knew a lot about the theories of contested authorship, but began digging and digging and digging. And what I started to excavate was some pretty fascinating things. The first, there was a company, I don't know, I, I don't think that they're still in existence called Narrative Science that Steve Lohr of the New York Times had been reporting about where they were claiming that they were going to write newspaper articles that would someday win a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and then I started digging a little bit further and found out that there was a lot of anxiety over uh, the Ashley Madison controversy because there were chatbots that were interfacing with humans in a way that were um, soliciting additional money. Um, Excuse me, so Gary, oh, thanks Gary soliciting right. additional uh, money from uh, users, um, promising the opportunity for uh, relationships moving forward in the future. And I thought, what a peculiar thing, the ability to be interfacing with algorithms or chatbots, or, and what does this mean for, for authorship in particular? And so I've kind of stayed in touch with these particular issues. I've been consulting with uh, uh, a, an artificial intelligence company, a large language model company uh, based out of Tel Aviv for the better part of a year um, and writing about it pretty actively. And one of the things that I think we know for sure is that the scale and the scope of these particular large language models are becoming so complicated and so complex that we absolutely need to start having significant conversations about them, which is what we've done at ASU and I know a lot of other universities across the country uh, have been doing to address a number of issues related to you know, student academic integrity and what are the implications for how students think about the writing process and so on. So I'm happy to say more, but I know that the panelists that I'm with here have a lot more wonderful and insightful things to say as well. Yeah, and we're definitely going to dig deeper into the teaching and learning angle, but I want to um, hand over to Danielle. Um, you are responsible um, in your varying daily activities for kind of keeping a, a 30,000 foot view uh, bird's eye view, as we talked about it in the planning meeting. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're keeping an eye on? So if I were to ask to characterize how things are going right now in higher ed in terms of thinking through the technologies, the first headline I would have is just that universities are, are truly, truly in a nascent phase of broader adoption. So the activity that we see mainly on the ground is focused on getting various communities within the universities up to speed on the technology, preparing and preparing people for as many different use cases as possible. Um, I would say that no one has figured it out yet. So really at this point in time, a major distinction is between the schools who have been able to quickly assemble uh, a cross-functional group to explore and address the issue um, and then communicate their intentions clearly to a broader community, versus the universities that are still just trying to determine whether or how to even create a coordinated response. In terms of how one can even get a perspective on what's going on across universities, my big shout out is to a study by uh, uh, three people who published their work in Educause a few weeks back. Um, so that's George Velicianos, Royce Kimmins, and Fanny Bonda. And I if it, probably someone will beat me to it, but I do have a, a link to the study. Um, what they did is they systematically reviewed university, uh, U.S. university website content, focusing on references to chat GPT. Now, as Kyle already acknowledged, generative AI is not just chat based, but uh, it was an interesting proxy. Uh, they were they were able to sort the references on the university websites into three main areas of activity. And I think that really gives you a sense of where the universities are at right now. Um, so the major area of activity was related to opinion pieces, articles, or announcements of lectures related to chat GPT. Um, the next area of largest area of activity was reports on experiments with generative AI. So basically bragging about the researchers that are already working on this issue at a deeper level at the, at the university. Um, and then finally was grading or other policies related to using uh, the technology in an educational setting. Um, there was about 20% of activity in that area. So not insignificant, but still the lowest frequency of occurrence. Um, I also just generally think that Educause is doing a good job. This is the Professional Association for IT Professionals. They put a number of resources out there. Um, and are regularly tracking the issue. 
beyond IT, another area of what I would call proactivity in the space is coming from teaching and learning center professionals. Uh, these are the ones who are already taking a lead on advising instructors on best practices and creating general guidance and policies related to its use. The POD network, which is the professional association for teaching learning professionals, has a very active Google group focused on AI and education, and you do not have to be a member of POD to join it, and I, I can give a link to that group as well. Um, and one of uh, its more active members is Lance Eden at College Unbound. He's been collecting classroom policies uh, for generative AI tools. So basically, you get a list of resources of how generative AI type technologies are being incorporated at the course level by instructors on the ground. Um, of course, there are concerns around academic integrity, um, but the reality is that actually few schools have outright banned the tools. The ones that have get headlines around it, but it's still a minority of schools. And the reality is that the methods of detection when it's related to academic integrity are just really uh, ill-formed, including quite a bit of critique of Turnitin, who has just recently uh, turned on their new uh, detector in this space. And you see some of the most concrete policies related to academic integrity um, and, and IP as well around in more of the publishing space, which thankfully we have representation on this panel. We're definitely going to dig in that. I want to ask you one thing before I um, move along. You said cross-functional groups at universities. What are some of the stakeholders that you're seeing <clears throat> in those cross-functional groups? Just so. uh, basically, your 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 various associate dean types representing the different units of activity uh, across teaching and and research. Um, there's usually um, set, uh, including you know those who are really focused on anything to do with uh, digital teaching or digital digital research. Uh, but ideally also representation from IT, from the library, from teaching and learning centers, all of the support service units. But here it's more just, it's not like they've created, I, I wouldn't say that I have a list of official committees created across a number of universities, but simply having these kinds of senior leaders actively in dialogue with each other, um, as opposed to working in silos is a hallmark of success right now. Another variation on that is it's not uncommon uh, at some at a number of institutions to actually have the teaching and learning center being the most visible locus of activity right now, the one responsible for um, posting um, actual university wide wide policies. Although these two are are pretty pretty nascent, the the Educa study that I cited doesn't go into detail at that level. Um, I've started to collect the policies that are university-wide, um, but I haven't done it systematically yet, and that will likely be a part of the project that I'm doing in the future, because I think a good comprehensive list and then refreshing it every few months is probably the best way, because they're just, they're being created every day in real time. All right. Um, so I want to go uh, into a little bit more depth than the, the teaching and learning, and I'm going to start um, with Ray and then be ready, uh, Kyle Jensen, because I'm handing over to you after that. Um, Ray, can you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing and seeing? Yeah, thanks, Heather. And totally echoing what uh, Danielle and Kyle Jensen had, had shared earlier um, in relation to teaching and learning. So as we know that for libraries, uh, there's a transition towards moving away from as a it's it's been happening for quite some time, moving away as an information repository and more into a, a teaching and learning support, right? As educators um, supporting those efforts with our teaching faculty and really um, engaging with that. So it really with ChatGPT, it really elevates uh, the, the library's role in, in sort of um, having these conversations. And of course, a lot of it is consensus driven. So like in terms of how um, people make decisions on, on the policy with ChatGBT, it's 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 sort of across the different different groups that uh, Danielle had mentioned. And so uh, for for things that are happening within um, the library space within teaching and learning, it's it's really clear that there are conversations on um, uh, plagiarism, citation, the, the, the general sort of support that that's been happening. But in a way, I think it's um, critical to think how, how it sort of supports some of um, the efforts that, 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 that currently is being in place. So let's say um, at my current role right now, I, I work with 300 plus graduate students uh, every year and, and we do these sessions on you know, critical reading, writing, research. And it's, this is the beginning of the term and we, we have this 
discourse community. So we define it where these are the set of expectations and set of skills that you as a person should, should be able to, to do by the end of this program, this one year program. And so that includes uh, being able to synthesize evidence, identify evidence, write it, critique, argument, argumentation, et cetera. So then with ChatGBT, we're, we're seeing sort of like, okay, it can, it can cer certainly accelerate and it can certainly support those who uh, really might benefit that. And then, and also in addition, we're seeing potentially the uh, concerns that it could hamper that critical thinking and reading writing skills, that research skills that that's so needed. And so it's sort of like a, like a balance between uh, figuring out how, how it could be best utilized for those who, who could really benefit and, and, and how it could perpetuate certain certain types of biases and harms. I think it was a question here that was flagged earlier, which we'll address. Um, the, the question is about really whether how we can support, for instance, students who um, uh, might be uh, multilingual, right? And, and students who might be experiencing ADHD. I think there was an insider higher ed article, an op-ed talking about a person's experience with ADHD and how ChatGBT um, helps them stay, stay grounded with, with, with the focus. And so I think with, with those um, uh, experiences, we need to sort of consider that. And, and so those are some, some discussions that are going on. Mm -hmm. And it was flagged earlier by, by Peter, I, I will add that about privacy. So privacy is, a, is certainly a major issue, and, and certainly um, the tool is is available, but but it's data, potentially creating data profiling, right? And 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 that in itself could have major impact on on our students, particularly those who are coming from marginalized backgrounds, undocumented students, LGBTQ students, if they're doing specific kind of research related to their positionality, that kind of data can can go out there. And so librarians are talking about ways to 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 sort of really bring it out there as as a disclaimer, but also working closely with a lot of um, faculty members to ensure that it's used in a responsible way, but also in a careful way. Um, so, so I'll kind of like pause here. Yep, and, and Kyle, is the sounding familiar, Kyle Jensen? Yeah, sounds about right. Um, I mean, I think that part of ChatGPT came onto the scene kind of so quickly and so abruptly and kind of had, the, had bad timing. I don't know if y'all agree with this, but, you know, it happened right at the end of November we're all getting ready to, you know, grade our finals and and take a break for a minute. And all anybody could talk about during, uh, you know, the winter graduation was how are we going to deal with this particular issue? There was a lot of planning that needed to take place, and you know, a lot of us who have been in in higher education have been part of having those particular kinds of conversations. The question that I get most consistently is, um, what? what value do these particular kinds of technologies hold for students in the classroom? Um, we see, I see a lot of that saying, you know, I've heard that um, students, some students are being accused of writing papers that are, let's see, too good. Um, and then it turns out that it's not a, a chat GPT uh, uh, academic integrity violation. And so one of the things that I've consistently said to anyone who's particularly interested is that while ChatGPT is definitely the most famous large language model, it's definitely not the only large language model. There are a number of other kinds of writing tools um, that have different kinds of design decisions that facilitate different kinds of writing sensibilities. So whereas ChatGPT gen tends to focus on large content generation, um, and we can talk more practically about you know, how to break through that and, and think critically about the design decisions that they make, there are other technologies such as WordTune, for example, where you, students import their writing, uh, they hit enter, and instead of being given, you know, a lot of content, what they're being given is different kinds of options to make decisions about. Uh, so, um, you know, if I wrote a particular sentence in and I said, and I hit enter, it would give me maybe 10, potentially 15 different ways of writing the sentence in multiple languages even, and the languages can have, you know, the you can have different languages even within the same sentence in order to kind of clarify and, and create different kinds of opportunities within it. And so, although, you know, large language modeling and, and these, these kinds of technologies are definitely exigent, we can always return back to the fundamental questions about what we're asking students to learn. And, 
you know, it doesn't really matter what the technology is, whether we're writing in a word processor or writing with an artificial intelligence technology, students and all writers really struggle with one really difficult thing. And it's how do I make the right decision when I'm making forming an argument? How do I make the right decision about what evidence I'm going to use? How do I make a persuasive case given all of the various options that I have available to me? And so there are certain kinds of technologies that punctuate the decision-making process and ask students to not only participate that in a more kind of creative way and critical way. Um, my own professional opinion is that ChatGPT doesn't do that particularly well, whereas other technologies like WordTune actually do that really successfully. Um, so for what it's worth, you know, what we try to do in my own classes, and I'm gonna be teaching a class later this afternoon where we're gonna be laying these kinds of technologies side by side from a methodological standpoint is to say, what affordances do these particular technologies give to you as a writer? How do they expand possibilities for you? How do they limit possibilities for you? And based on what you decide, use it, use all there is to use to improve the quality of your argument, knowing that you can make the decision about how, what is most effective given your purpose, audience, and situation. Great, thank you. And and Ray, we've had a request uh, that's been plussed in the in the chat. I, I guess um, we're all concerned about privacy issues in online platforms, search behaviors, algorithms. Is there a particular additional concern with ChatGPT, or is it just you know this is an yet another example of where profiles might be collected and you know potentially data sold? Right, exactly. Uh, it's, it's another example, another outlet, and it's it's just getting a lot more a lot more attention, right, than than the usual ones. Um, and I think uh, it really could pose a risk because we don't know where where this is going. And and for educators, you know, we, we really take it seriously. You know, the, the surveillance that's happening. Um, and so I I think um, yeah, it's it's just another example. Great. Thanks for that that clarification. Um, I want to go to Kyle uh, Courtney. We've had some uh, some some questions and some conversation about um, uh, the copyright um, implications. And I know that when we had this planning call, you know, you said that there were uh, there were lots of issues um, that you kind of touched on. And you said one way to look at it is an issue of input and output. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so this is a challenge because the law of AI is just nebulous right now, but now it's exploding. So just to note, by the way, the privacy considerations, I'm not even going to talk about that, but ChatGPT was shut off in Italy just the other day because of the EU's data protection laws and the Italy data protection regime wants to make sure that they're following the rules. So right now, ChatGPT can't even be used in Italy. So it's kind of interesting elements of that, but I'm putting that all aside for a moment because you know, I struggle in some of these same areas that everyone else is discussing here, not just my role as a lawyer. I teach a legal writing workshop at the law school. And of course, we're like, hey, they can write contracts. Um, I do a seminar course called Cyber Law. So this is true worlds colliding for me in every way as a copyright scholar, a teacher, and a user of copyrighted works. Um, and I'm also a fearful sci-fi fan. I mean, we haven't talked about this, but who can't conjure images of the Terminator when we're talking about all of this right now? Um, so the idea of input and output is, is basically two questions under copyright, right? Does AI's large-scale training infringe upon the works or data used to train the AI, right? People are creating images or texts or things, um, and that's what's used to train it. And then the other end of it, once the once you've done something or created something with, with the aid of AI, should AI-generated works be copyrightable in and of themselves, right? So this is this is all... I think part of the challenge that I think we're all facing in some capacity. So just, just to note, copyright law is supposed to be balanced, right? So copyright creators get some protection in their work. Not They can't prevent everything from happening, in fact, because the other end is all the exceptions that are built into copyright, which gives users of those copyright materials some user rights, right? So the, the copyright in itself is a balance of those acts. And so when we talk about the input, AI systems are trained to create literary, visual, and other artistic works by exposing the program to all of this data, right? OpenAI, for example, acknowledges that their programs are changed on large publicly available data sets that include copyrighted works, right? And so that gives the machine learning ability 
to, you know, produce its output. But again, necessarily, it absolutely involves making copies of the data to be analyzed. Now, creating copies without express or implied permission from the various copyright holders might infringe copyright, right? That idea, if I dump a million images that I didn't create in to train a machine, um, that could be because I'm making copies of the work, right? And again, you need to generally get permission. But as I said, there's a whole host of exceptions, including fair use that made this. So, so for example, Stability ALI is, is being sued currently, right? Um, and they train everything by scraping public websites and storing them in their servers as compressed copies. Now they change them to data, once zeros, et cetera. And then they produce new images through mathematical software process. And I put new because, you know, how new they are is certainly subject to the second thing, the output. But the new images are based on these learning processes. Stable diffusion draws on them every time they're assembling a given output. And that's why we can get something. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop this in the chat. Um, this fascinated me. Uh, this was uh, somebody did a series of uh, presidents and said, "Make them look cool with mullets and sunglasses." That's it. That's all the prompt here. So certainly, pictures of Abraham Lincoln and Carter and everything are might be in the public domain. But the prompt is what created this. And this is kind of one of those fun and interesting areas. But obviously the discoverability that people were using copyrighted materials is what caused that first lawsuit. Now I'd like to mention that certainly we've seen new technology transfer the, the notion of risk into lower end risks for certain types of uses. Now, for example, you and I type the word red car into Google images right? And we get hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of pictures of red car that are presented to us in a nice interface where all the red cars are presented. Now, that was found legal many moons ago. Um, and that idea is that it's using the images for a different purpose than the original. Well, this is kind of fascinating because we've had that thread run through law for a long time. Even the idea of using something for a different purpose is the very breadth and scope of education, right? What is a jazz class without using some jazz? What is a poetry class without hearing or utilizing some poetry? How can we complete our educational work or dissertations or things without using third-party materials? We might use them for a different reason for the original. So again, the original pictures of the red car that's presented to me on Google Images, maybe it's a dealership, maybe it's a coloring book. What's the purposes of its use by Google? is that to present us an index of the entire swath of the internet so that we can more easily find and research what we need. And again, they don't care about the original purpose. They're not competing with that original purpose. And then of course it gets to some other parts of this test. So we, we've seen this, but in the lawsuit that's coming from some artists against Stability AI, they're saying Stability downloaded without permission. The compressed copies are still copies. And they called it basically a complex collage tool. And they said, this creates market harm. But they might have a little bit of a fight here in the US with regards to uh, transformative fair use. But of course, Getty has also sued um, Stability AI, but in England, and they have a different area. So, mm -hmm. so again, that idea of input training could be infringement or could be a fair use, too weird to see. But we do have precedent in this space. The output is even more fascinating to me. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, the copyright rules generally say that you have to have human interaction of some kind, right? Non-humans don't get copyright in the materials, right? And courts have taken a really dim view that animals, uh, divine beings, ghosts, this is real, <laughs> um, can take advantage of copyright protection. They cannot. So everyone remembers the monkey selfie. That's going to be the most famous. I also like the one of the ghost that possessed somebody and they wrote a book. That's a fun one. Can't get copyright. The ghost can't get copyright. And then the elephant that takes pictures. That's another good one. So that idea that somehow uh, something that's generated by AI can't get copyright. Now, in 2019, Stephen Thayer tried to register a picture on behalf of an algorithm. And he wanted the algorithm to be the copyright holder. And the copyright office rejected that and said, this is not copyrightable. His, his title of his work is called A Recent Entrance to Paradise. You can look at it online. It's part of a series that simulated near-death experience in which an algorithm reprocessed pictures to create this hallucinatory image of a 
fictional narrative about the afterlife, but they rejected it. They said a machine made this in some capacity. And so that idea that it's been rejected, recently we had a very interesting case. This is 2022, so in the law, that's super recent. Um, a comic book artist named uh, Chris Castanola made a comic book called Zaria of the Dawn, in which she utilized AI to create the comic book images, but she wrote the text, arranged all the images in the layout. Initially, she had been granted a copyright in that work, but then they reversed that decision and they said, you know what? No, the machine made the images. However, because technology are not the product of human authorship, you can't get copyright images. But because she did utilize her own expressive integrity to put the comic book together, the arrangement, the compilation, and wrote the comic book story, you know, the actual words themselves, they gave her a copyright in that. So they, they, they separated everything out, which is something that happens a lot. So in my talk recently, I did a talk for the Fine Arts Library at Harvard, and a, a scholar said, I'm writing a book, and, you know, certainly we utilize the book to, you know, I wrote the book, but we use this enhancing image. And so that idea is that somehow they used a little bit of AI to enhance an image that made it better and more useful for the scholarly uh, text that she was including in it. And I was thinking, well, wasn't that interesting? What if we get to AI machine works can't be copyrightable, but what if it's combined with? So I'm calling this AI enhanced. The author and the machine work together. Mm -hmm. So some creative expression of that. Are they joint copyright holders yeah. between the machine and them? Uh, is it in the public domain because you can't enhance it? Is it owned by the author? So the best part of this is that I don't have to answer any of these questions mm -hmm. today. <laughs> I just have to outline where the law currently sits. Okay. So and I want to hand over, this is a perfect segue to yeah. Teresa. Um, and but I don't I don't want to um can we talk about the the challenges, but also the opportunities um, that uh, you're seeing uh, and where you sit at uh, American Institute of Physics? Um, certainly. So, and I just, you know, I just wanted to go back just for a second to something that Kyle just said about um, Italy banning, um, you know, Chat GPT in um, in Italy and the use of it. Um, and as a publisher, and as all publishers, you, you know, we need to be mindful of these changes because we have to be GDPR compliant. So, you know, these these decisions make you know have a big impact on on us as publishers. Um, the other thing we, we did recently uh, within this last year is, you know, AAP Publishing launched the use of um, credit taxonomy and requiring our authors to actually self-identify what their contributions were. And this was meant, you know, to help the authors, um, you know, get credit where credit is due, credit for their work, you know, to, to reduce the amount of guest authorship that uh, an author might be putting on a paper, um, you know, and allowing the authors, um, you know, and all of the authors on the paper to, to self-identify what their actual contributions were. It helps them with their tenure as well. A lot of times their institutions require understanding what their contributions were to their research. So that's another area, um, which while this isn't AI, it is something that we implemented to help um, with, you know, authorship and ethics around proper um, authorship. So opportunities though for um, AI, because all AI, you know, is not created equal, but what we have um, done at AAP Publishing is, you know, we have at the forefront of everything that we're experimenting with is, you know, how is this helping the researcher? So often um, a researcher uh, or, a, you know, even a grad student while they're writing their papers, you know, might not have all of the information that they need um, to, and their, their advisors may not be, you know, the best to uh, equip them with what it is they might need to do to have their paper um, published. So what we've been experimenting with are different um, solutions, you know, that are available. And we have, you know, some tests going on with some pre-submission tools where an a you know an author can run their article through you know an ai based manuscript checker if you will so instead of um having their paper you know pushed back to them for simple things like your 
your if, you know your abstract isn't formatted correctly, et cetera. It helps to identify for the author, you know, what those problem areas will be um, or could potentially be. Um, you know, if the journal that they're submitting to requires um, certain statements like a data availability statement or a conflict of interest, you know, and as I mentioned, their author contributions and even their funding information, it will help elevate that. Um, to the authors to know that they have to actually implement that and put that into their um, their article so their article can continue on with peer review. Um, we have uh, experiments currently going on right now with um, AI for digital copy editing. Um, and the, the digital copy editing is not meant to replace um, the human loop because, you know, there's a certain nuance and subjectivity to some of the copy editing um, functions that happen where an AI um, doesn't possess that same, obviously, level of understanding or nuance. So there is a human loop that checks it. So when someone has spoken about trust and trusting the AI, um, you know, we've seen through, you know, trial and error that, yes, you know, a human does have to check it. You know, there can be algorithms in the background and rule-based um, tools that you're using, but you still do have to have that opportunity to check um, what the AI is suggesting um, to correct or update or to add. Um, and this is to help the, the paper, um, you know, go through the process more, more quickly. Um, we do have um, experiments happening now, even with um, the insertion of figures, where the authors may be able to embed their figures directly into their manuscript versus having to upload them. And they're, they're able to be um, used um, you know, for the publication of, of the articles. So there is a lot of opportunity with the use of AI because speed to publication when you're, when you're a researcher um, and you're trying to get your paper published seems to be at the forefront. So they, you know, it's nice to have all of the, the bells and whistles, but they really just need their content up there because they could have grants pending, um, could be, again, um, patents could be pending, et cetera. There's a variety of reasons why speed to publication is so important to the researcher. So how do we as publishers help them on this journey? Um, and that's some of the things that we've been working on, um, you know, as a publisher over the past, um, you know, two years and have plans into the future. Um, but you know that's the seat in which which I'm sitting in um, from a publisher perspective. But it's really um, we you know we also utilize tools for um, you know at the, for plagiarism. So all of the articles are run through a similarity check to make certain that there's not um, a lot of overlap. And then again, this is where the human comes in. The, the AI can can give you a report and a finding but you need someone to actually interpret that report. So you can't just say, if it's got a score of 30 or above, we're just going to discount it because that may not be true um, overlap. That may be um, areas of the paper where you, know, you are seeing things that are, are done in a similar way. So like the methods um, section, and sometimes it even looks at the references that someone may be using. So these tools do help um, the authors with the, the creation of their their um, research papers and um, to put them on a path for acceptance. Um, so that's that's those are the experiments that we're working on um, at AAP Publishing, and we're seeing um, a lot of positive uptake um, from the authors and a lot of positive feedback um, we've received so far. So there's a question in in the in the chat for you uh, or in the Q and A. Um, is AIP experimenting with AI in peer review? In peer review, not to actually be a peer review of the article, because we certainly cannot replace an editor um, or an AE with making those decisions, but we are um, beginning to experiment with it in peer review where it can help identify um, areas um, that could be potentially a problem or, um, you know, help to um identify papers that might be likely to be on the path of acceptance. So we're, we're starting some of those experiments now. Those are in very early stages and that is not on live content right now, if I can say okay. it that way. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, Peter in his talk alluded a little bit to kind of like um, ex ex experiments and trying to, you know, disallow or prohibit the use of, of certain tools probably are going, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing it, but you know, the, the, the road to ruin. Um, is it possible, um, Ray, to detect, and, and, and Kyle Jensen loved your thought on this, 100% that something's been done by a computer and not a person? 
I, I, I don't think it's, it's possible with 100%. And the way that the tool is getting more sophisticated with the new iterations coming in, it, it's, it's really, really hard to see. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, we do have um, some, some tools like uh, GPT-0 by Princeton's undergraduate student, Edward Tian, that I've been testing it on, sharing it. And, and it, it, does, it, it does flag. But as, as it was hinted in the chat box earlier, it really can create um, these biases that are inherent in all of us, which is as instructors, you might be like, hey, how can this student write, write like this, right? It, they, they must have used ChatGPT. But in essence, maybe they didn't, right? So, so there's, there, there's that, that, that concern. But in terms of your, your question, I, I, I don't think um, these other tools could, could really sort of look into 100%, but maybe Kyle Jensen might have another thought. Yeah, I shouldn't have said 100%, because like 100%, but what do you I'm think? flattered by your confidence, Ray. I don't have the technical expertise to answer uh, that question. But what I will say as an educator is I think that the, the preoccupation with detection is a little bit of a red herring, and it actually puts us in a, mind, a deficit mindset that is pretty consistent with how we've approached writing instruction independent of artificial intelligence technologies. So if we're constantly looking for the things that students aren't doing correctly, or we're trying to kind of pinpoint and say, um, you know, you are not doing this in earnest, you are not developing the kind of intellectual traits, that's a pedagogical approach that has deeper implications that has absolutely nothing to do with artificial intelligence. The question I would ask is, well, if you want to know whether or not your students are using, you know, AI tools, the best place to do that is to actually become intimate with their writing and their writing process to get to know them as students, to ask them questions about what they want to accomplish and to emphasize the kind of purpose that they need to write with, the kinds of audiences they want to reach, the kinds of situations they want to have an impact in. And from that space, develop a working intellectual relationship and then ask at various points, to what extent can this artificial intelligence technology enhance the argument? To what extent could it compromise your ability to write as, a, uh, as an emerging writer or whatever the case may be? One of the things that I found particularly fascinating, I've been teaching a methods course here at ASU, and the presupposition is, and the, I think probably the panic is that students want to use these particular technologies and they know a lot about them and how to access them and use them. Um, when I approach my class, which I will say uniformly is pretty tech savvy, they're like, not only we don't know a lot about it, but we're not particularly interested in what it has to offer us because we don't want to risk the possibility of having any ideas not be characterized as our own. And we don't know enough about the technology to actually uh, use it in ways that help us uh, for, advance our own agenda. So I say this to my colleagues all the time and encourage everybody that when it comes to students, I think the best you know, method is pretty simple. It's sit down and talk with them, ask them what they want to write, uh, ask them what they know about artificial intelligence technologies, ask them to tinker with it a little bit and say, well, in what ways can this potentially help your writing process and in what ways can it pull away from it and ask them to think critically. And to the extent that we're doing that, I think that writing instruction, although it is inflected differently now by artificial intelligence technologies. It doesn't really change in a meaningful way um, for what it's worth. Yeah, I'm thinking of the early days, you know, spell checking, grammar checking, you know, personally, I, I dislike the, the grammar check. Um, if I've done something some way, it's, it's usually uh, for, for a reason, but um, those are the kinds of things that, uh, you know, just naturally kind of get into, their, into your workflow. <clears throat> um, well, Heather, you meant, I mean, that's an important okay. point, and I, I don't want to take up too much time here or linger over it, but as an English professor, the preoccupation with correctness is the question that I receive the most. So like if someone walks up to me and they say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm, I'm, you can't see this, but I'm six foot seven. So I look more like a basketball player than an English professor. I'll say I'm an English professor and like, oh, I need to watch my grammar around you. And I think that that's particularly funny because I don't particularly watch a lot, as you figured out, no doubt during this panel, I don't pay a lot of attention to grammar myself uh, as I'm delivering an argument. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that we have a long, long history of thinking about writing in terms of correction, almost to the extent that we, when we think about the work of writing and why students don't particularly want to engage in the work of writing, it's because we're presumed not to be very good at it. 
And so what I'm worried about as an educator is that with these tools are like, okay, well, I'm not very good at writing and clearly this technology can do it better than I can. So I'm just gonna export that responsibility to the technology. And that to me seems like a really bankrupt arrangement. We need to figure out a way to have a more affirmation-based approach to writing instruction. And that's why earlier when I was talking about the differences between like say a chat GPT versus a technology like WordTune, if WordTune is multiplying possibilities and asking students to make decisions about it, it's taking a more affirmation-based approach saying, you have the, you know more than the technology about which words, which sentences, which versions of this particular um, sentence, paragraph, whatever, um, are best suited to your audience purpose and situation. Whereas if you have technologies that just create fully formed text that you just turn over, that tends to, you know, inculcate a deficit attitude over and over and over again. So I want to be really, really careful here and recognize that there are technologies available in the educational space that actually do encourage a different disposition toward writing instruction mm -hmm. and writing more generally. It doesn't necessarily have to be educational. Um, that, again, places the writers in that space of, I need to not only imagine possibilities, but make decisions once those possibilities are available to me. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that um, that that clarification there. Um, I see lots of like celebratory uh, and and thumbs up going up the screen. So I think your your point is resonating with the the attendees. Um, there's a question uh, in the chat or in the Q and A for you, Danielle. When talking about the responses from academia, how do you account for the fact that academic departments rely on universities' guidance for AI rather than making their own? So there might actually be a university policy but then the concerns of the faculty come about in different articles. I don't see this one AI policy as being necessarily different than how you characterize universities having policies in general that might um, you know, be effective at different levels, but is that something that you could be looking at as part of the research? Um, I think it's really important to be mindful of the different disciplinary or, or sub subfield applications of the technology and the reality that, you know, it's it's very hard to have a one size fits all approach to policy. And um, it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about with Kyle and the idea that, you know, Kyle has to navigate a lot of people asking very specific questions around writing. And we I, I would argue actually put an outsized amount of attention on that use case maybe because it's the one that we can generally relate to no matter where we are at, at, in academia or in our day-to-day -day lives, like uh, general writing is a more accessible thing to speculate over. When a lot of like the more serious issues related to academic integrity would actually be related to deep fakes and the idea that there's a number of STEM fields where already even without this sophisticated technology, researchers are regularly faking their uh, results in terms of the images that come from mic even microscopes. Um, and so the issue of, can we detect those? Um, and, and can we make those? Like that's on, that's on a whole other level. And, and so one could, can, cannot discount the disciplinary or subject related responses, but it goes back to what I was reflecting on earlier, which is that uh, a university can, can only govern certain kinds of use cases effectively. And the reality is, is that we've always had in, in, in the, the higher education world, not just the university governing norms or expectations. This is a huge place where the journals have a role to play because they're the ones that, uh, and, and, the, and the scholarly societies, which often, operate their own journals or series of journals, they're going to come up with their own norms around what I would call issues related to the research enterprise, which is different than teaching and learning. Um, and so you really can't lose track of either of those in parallel. One other example, just to give you a sense of how I think sometimes there's an outsized reflection related to writing. One of the most promising but like interesting applications related to generative AI in teaching and learning is actually grading of different, uh, not related to grading and not of the humanities ill. Things like math, where showing your work, even that can be um, you know, processed systematically in a way that one maybe necessarily can't do when reading an essay. And there's a number of startups. You wanna look into one, look at Plum, 
PLOM, very interesting backstory about the technology that they're using to, to do grading. Um, um, we, in, in, we focus so much on the writing angle when there's so many other activities in higher ed, either for research or teaching that are gonna be affected by this. Thank you. Um, I want to go around and give everybody, as we're coming up on time, just an opportunity to to give a few last words. Um, what would you hope you know attendees would 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 take away uh, from this session today? You know, something we didn't get to cover yet, but you'd love to maybe uh, talk about more later in the in the breakout sessions. Just uh, anything you want to um, to go ahead and add. Um, I'll start with uh, Teresa. Um, and. I don't know if there's anything we I didn't necessarily cover. It's just, you know, it's a it's an evolving landscape. We have to all be very mindful of of changes and um, you know, not stand on um, I think tradition. We have to all be open to, you know, how do we navigate this going forward? Um I think that's the mindset I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh Kyle Jensen. Just to encourage everybody to continue reading. Uh, Therese is correct. We're in an evolving landscape and it's hard to keep up with all of the evolutions. And in the face of uh, this evolution, it can feel like you just can't ever keep up. But I think it's really important, not just for academics, but also everyone around the country. This is a technology, uh, AI technologies and emerging AI technologies are going to redefine how we engage, not only with one another, but also with any kind of digital interface. So if we can continue to read and write and think our way through it and talk proactively together, I think we will find a kind of level playing field or a level, level ground where we can um, start to make reasonable decisions as we move forward about how to interact um, and do what's best for not just ourselves, but for future generations moving forward. Thank you, Kyle Courtney. Uh, yeah, you should watch this space, every space for the lawsuits that are going on. Uh, honestly, everything would come to a grinding halt. Um, machine learning would be driven underground um, if we don't consider the fact that the, the law indicates in some capacity that there is a balance here. Uh, a lot of these companies that are very upset that their works are being used without permission are doing it for possibly monetization purposes and not the the real purpose of copyright was promote the progress of science and the useful arts, right? Um, you know, the first copyright act in this country was an act passed for the expansion of learning, right? So this is very tied to this. So there's going to be a lot of back and forth and a lot of hot takes on what should be done with this. But I, I think certainly if we don't settle those issues in the next few years, um, there'll be concerns that, you know, transparency will go away. In fact, one organization has already driven underground. They're not telling you how they're training their AI because of the result of these lawsuits. And if we want transparency and more accountability and stuff, we have to allow uses of copyright materials to to explore um, uh, the, the, what they were intended to do. So, so keep an eye out. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we'll probably be hearing more about all these things at the Charleston Conference in November. Danielle. Uh, I would just say be empowered that, you know, to claim anybody claiming who there is an expert, it's unlikely they are. And there is uh, a use case and a point of interest for any person in their professional context. We didn't get a chance to talk as much about librarians in this session, but there's a number of really interesting activities and resources that are happening in the library world specifically. I, for example, have been very, I really enjoyed George, George Hart's review of various generative AI D, uh, uh, tools just posted the other day from the reference librarian's perspective. I'll put a link. It is on LinkedIn. I don't know if everybody has that one, but I thought there's a number of ways that these tools can be helpful to our work, to the work of those that we serve, particularly in a library context. And, um, you know, I would, I would just say, you know, feel, feel, feel empowered to, to, to engage, even if you don't think you're an expert yet. Great, thanks. And uh, since I made you go first for the introductions, Ray, I've held you to give you the last word here, so. Great, thanks, Heather. Yeah, in addition, I, I wanted to say that there's a labor that's happening um, that, that's impacting the library workers. Um, so uh, someone mentioned in the chat box about hallucinations. So these are like these made up citations that are falsified, maybe the authors are right, uh, authors are, are actual people, but the titles aren't. And what I'm seeing is that it's it's creating a lot of extra work for reference librarians in virtual chat, 
as well as resource sharing departments where they're just like searching and not realizing it's actually a hallucination that that a student or a faculty member used, you know, chat GBT to generate. So it's creating all this additional sort of work that is is quite quite you know problematic and it's inevitable. So so that's that's one one part I want to mention. The second part is that um, there's a question on cheating and plagiarism that that there's a of opportunity to rethink what that is. And so Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook created this really interesting infographic that I'm gonna share in the chat right now that really has a series of questions and, and how students are using AI or not, right? And sort of like a way to gauge and sort of discuss that with your faculty and, and students and campus. So at my uh, institution right now, like right about five minutes before our call, my dean asked me if I could lead this conversation with a group of faculty to discuss our stance. So it's sort of like, you know, bringing it all together and um, having this so, sort of impacting my, my work immediately. Now, the last part I will say is algorithmic, algorithmic literacy, which is um, a, a skill being aware of the use of algorithms and online applications, services, and how they work, and how to critically evaluate algorithm decision-making will be on the rise for those who are in information literacy, instruction. There will be a lot of grant-funded projects on algorithmic literacy, so um, that's tied May, may be connected to ChatGPT or not. So I just uh, wanted to share that. Great, thanks. And I hope that um, all of our speakers will stick around um, this afternoon when we go into the breakout rooms um, because we'd love to dig in uh, more deeply into these topics. So um, thanks everyone who participated today. Uh, we really appreciate your thoughts, your insights and all of your recommendations. And I know I've got a lot of websites open now to go back and look um, later. Uh, so with that, I will hand back over to Leah and then she'll hand us off to lunch. All right. Thank you so much, Heather, and to all of our panelists. This was a fascinating conversation. Um, I do hope that everybody will come back after lunch. We're going to be back here at one o'clock for our next session. It's going to be in the same webinar link, so you could even just leave it open if you wanted to, or you can go back using the link provided in your confirmation email. Um, it, takes, it looks like this. You just click the day one sessions and click the blue launch button, and you'll be right back with us at one o'clock. Uh, we have uh, AI tools to watch presentations, moderated Q&A discussion, and our breakout rooms. Um, I'm really excited about the afternoon schedule, so please come back and join us. We'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.